I think this uh, presentation is uh, is very is very sensitive in uh, projecting the reality on the ground in the occupied territories. Um, obviously, most of us, if not all of us, have heard of the plight of the. Uh, people under occupation there. There were some uh, comments that were made in this uh, presentation, I think, that are uh, worth reiterating or underlining. Uh, first of all, the American, uh, the American public really doesn't get involved uh, in any major or in any substantial way with uh, having their say on what's happening in Palestine. Obviously most of us know that this is due to the uh, disproportionate influence that the Zionist or Jewish lobby has in this country upon the decision makers. Um, they are concentrated in the media the major networks, and uh, whether that's that has to be, whether it's television or radio or the press or whatever uh, media that uh, influences public opinion, they also have a very significant presence in the United States financial system, the banking system, and then obviously in government. So when you have these three components interlocked with each other. Um, then you have what we have today, an American public that is basically uh, withdrawn from um, exerting its, uh, its um, influence on the decision makers here to change American policy in the Middle East. Um, we Muslims, this is, I don't know if it ran through your mind when you were watching this or not, but it definitely ran through my mind. I mean, um, obviously there's a significant proportion of the Jewish population that has been fooled, duped, and uh, led uh, into a blind support for the Zionist, racist, expansionist policies of uh, the, the government in Tel Aviv. Um, and... Uh, to a certain extent, you can understand, any human being can understand uh, that some Jews in the world are going to be supportive of Zionism. Not that it's justified or it's right, but simply because uh, they have a, 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 their own narrative of history that says that they didn't have a homeland for uh, since the time of the Israeli and the biblical prophets. And so now they, they want a homeland and they got this territory and you saw the way that they obtained this by force and by, uh, by killing and murdering and assassinations and bloodshed and warfare and uh, all of the nasty things that come with uh, what went into the making of this nation state. But on the other hand, and this obviously the, the presentation did not go into this, but it certainly should have, I think, occurred to you as it occurred to me, that what are we, the Muslims, doing? Okay, the Jews are, well, many Jews are supporting Zionism. But how are we Muslims, and Zionism is not a just cause, it doesn't have any, um, any attraction to it if, if you step outside of the tribal and the ethnic and the racist mentality that makes up Zionism. So they are supporting their illegitimate nation state. But we have a legitimate cause, how are we supporting that? This is what... Uh, 
what looks you in the eye, I guess, when you when you watch the scenes that that we were all watching together. Uh, something has to be done about this. We can't uh, rely, I think, on discredited uh, governments that have been torturing this issue in their own way for the past 62 or 63 years. They've simply proven to anyone willing to open their eyes and use their minds that they are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Now with that, what do you do? You, you despair, you give up, you say, oh, I can't do anything. Or, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think a person who is just an average human being, much less being a committed Muslim, could say, well, you know, this is meant to be and there's nothing we can do about it and we have to wait until the end of time until this is solved. So the, the, I don't think you can... I mean, you know, what comes to mind is... Yeah, you and I live the real world. We know that there are fanatics in this world. We, they come in different shapes and models. There are Christian fanatics, there are Muslim fanatics, and there's Jewish fanatics all over. And, uh, and the easy way out, this may have not occurred to you, this may have not crossed your mind, but um, one of the thoughts that you know comes to your mind is, if you're thinking... Uh, is that, well, you know, this is a problem in which uh, two um, opposite sides are torturing themselves uh, and this is not going to have a solution until uh, Isa alayhi salam, or Jesus Christ in some people's language, uh, comes to the world and solves this issue and others who say this is not going to be solved until an Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam is going to come to this world and solve this issue. But I don't think that this is the right way to think. You can't just sit down or step aside or take a neutral position and say that those who were complicit in the crucifixion are at war with those who were complicit in the shahada of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and that therefore both of them right now are paying the price for this type of history. That's an easy way out of it. And as I said, fanatics come in different colors and different forms and different uh, modes. And some of this. Uh, undisclosed fanaticism has the strong undercurrent to it. And I don't think uh, the prophets or the imams, if they were alive and they were privy to something, well, watch just like us sitting in the seat here and watching some of the, By the way, you know, much of this, as you may have realized, is, uh, the comments and the um, and the statements that were made by these uh, individuals, most of them were Jewish, anti-Zionist Jews. I don't know if you caught that. And then there were some, uh, let's say, uh, pro-Palestinian uh, American officials who, um, who were making the intelligent comments ab about what was happening in Palestine. Of course, you saw that you know, there were Palestinians and Jews who were on the ground there in the field where um, this misery is unfolding. Uh, but the ones who were um, speaking almost uh, in a civilized manner about Israeli and Zionist policies were people who uh, matured out of the Zionist shell and can now look at it in a more uh, neutral and fair way and thus comment uh, against uh, the Zionist nation state. Um, unfortunately, we Muslims don't have... Uh, I uh, also watch the names of the producers of this. There are some Muslim names, uh, some Muslims who are involved in this, and I'm not trying to knock down their effort. But watching something like this and then realizing that there is no uh, Islamic um, uh, intelligent uh, analysis or uh, uh, statements about what is happening there, that, that 
also in and of itself is a very serious um, a flaw that hopefully in the coming years we will have you know a coming uh, generation of Muslims who will have enough uh, mental uh, integrity and enough uh, moral courage to say the truth to speak truth to power something that we've been lacking all along Noam Chomsky for example I don't know if most if, if you know this but he was uh, I think I can't remember during the 1970s or 1960s he used to go to Israel and he used to be on the Moshav there these uh, agricultural settlements that were um, supported by uh, many left-leaning uh, individuals in the world. They'd go for a stint there, either a summertime or a full year, and help out with the, uh, uh, the tasks of uh, having what they call the desert bloom. But obviously now he, he's making statements uh, that contradict uh, part of uh, his actual effort uh, a few uh, decades ago. Um, and then looking at all of this, we also uh, realize that, uh, I don't know if, it, if you ever um, thought about it this way, but the Zionist uh, Israeli Jews, they make a big fuss about the fact that um, they endured uh, a very steep price for their Jewishness in Europe. And they concentrate on the Holocaust in that regard. They say six million people perished, were killed during World War II, uh, by the Nazis and the Germans. And I'm not here to debate, you know, the Holocaust or speak for or against it. But you'd ask, let's assume for a moment that what they are saying is true. That's a big assumption. But let's assume that what they are saying is true. Six million Jews were killed uh, during World War II in Europe. Now, World War II ended in 1945. And the uh, Israeli nation state uh, took root in 1947-1948. So we're talking about two to three years after the uh, terrible and horrible Holocaust took place. Then you have, uh, and I think you may have caught the number of Jews, there was a significant influx, uh, movement of people uh, Jewish people from Europe to uh, Palestine in the um, in the years of World War II and in the immediate years after that. Now, how can it fit in anyone's mind? I, I present this to you because obviously one individual is not the uh, as much thought as that individual may have given this matter is not the final uh, arbiter of this issue. But I ask you. How can a population that endured and suffered and was tormented and almost virtually eliminated in Europe, how can it, in a matter of two or three years, do a Holocaust, begin to do a Holocaust in reverse? How can this happen? You come out of one of, described in the mainstream media, as one of the worst experiences of the human race. Think about you yourself being in that condition. You lost family. They were emaciated. They, they show you the bodies, the skeleton uh, images of uh, Jewish people who were shipped on trains to concentration camps in, uh, in Germany and in Poland and these areas. Okay, you see all of that. And you can, in yourself, you can internalize the misery of it all. Okay, you know that. How can you, having survived what your family members did not survive and your extended family members did not survive, how can you come to a land, say, this is my homeland now, and I'm going to do to the Palestinian people what was done to me in Europe? 
the, if, if, if the information we are getting is correct, and I have my question marks about it, but I'm setting those aside for a moment. But if the information we are getting is correct, we have one of two answers to this. Either to this meaning to how is it possible for hundreds of thousands of survivors of the Holocaust in Europe with the uh, premium price that they, pray, uh, that they paid with the loss of such a high number of people, six million, how could they, in a matter of just two or three years, launch into decades of a slow motion holocaust against another population? The answer to that is one of two things. In my mind, you're free to contribute to this. Either that did not happen the way and the, with the numbers that they are presenting it. So if it didn't happen like that, it was just a few people who suffered in the Holocaust, then it, it did not touch all of those people who went in and settled the way they did, stealing other people's lands and property, etc., etc. And therefore, they are free from the, the human agony that lives in you, that makes it impossible for you to do to others what others did to you, especially when these others, being the Palestinians, were not the Germans. So it places a big question mark on how that happened. That's one answer. The other answer, the, the, the figure stands. Six million perished in the Holocaust. So how do we have this type of population doing these types of things to other people who are not involved in their torturous history in Europe? How can this be? The other, the other answer to that is they, they would consider the victims, the Palestinians in this case, they would, whether they are Muslims, Christians, or whatever, they, they would consider them less than human beings. That's the only way you're going to rationalize this type of treatment. You saw the, the missiles, you saw the, the firebombs, you saw the explosions, you saw the bullets, you saw the blood, you saw all of this. How can a population do this type of thing to another population if it considers that population equally human. So, the, one of the two answers are going to be an answer pertaining to the quantity, the six million, or to the quality of another non-Jewish human life. There's no other answer to it. But that's what we have. Now, on a more serious note, and you know, on a more serious note, I think that uh, we uh, should take this uh, this suffering of the Palestinian uh, condition, and there are Christians and there are Muslims in this. The Jews who are anti-Zionist don't. Um, uh, don't run into the type of problems and the type of uh, dislocation and loss of life in there that the Muslims and the Christian Palestinians do. There are Jews who are opposed to Zionism. Some of them are secular Jews, and you saw some of them there. And some of them are religious Jews, and I, I noted one of them at least in this presentation, or two. Uh, who on the basis of Judaism are opposed to the type of uh, atrocities that uh, we were watching. But they don't, they don't fall into the same category as Muslims and Christians do when it comes to uh, the Zionist policies in the occupied territories. Now, I've, I've encountered individuals, I'm not saying that some of you are like this, but I've encountered, encountered individuals that uh, they just don't want to be bothered with the Palestinian issue. I mean, they feel sorry and all of this, and just like an average human being. But if you tell them, well, is, don't you want to do something about this? They say, no, I don't want to, you know, I, 
I feel sorry and all, but you know, I, I'm just not into doing anything about this. Um, there's nothing much you can do with people like that. But if this issue, and this issue is becoming uh, a, a global issue, it, it has nothing to do um, with a regional conflict, as some people, especially Zionist-controlled mainstream media, want to present it. It's an Arab-Israeli conflict. That's a, that's a misrepresentation of what it is. This is a conflict that is drawing in the whole world. The price of petroleum at the pump has to do with this conflict. The American economy right now is tied into this conflict. The invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan in one of its dimensions has to do with this conflict. We have a shrinking world and if people want to live in their own individualistic cocoons, well, they are, they are free to do that. There's nothing much we... But if you are up uh, up to the events, you understand what is happening in this world, I think we don't have a choice, you know, something has to be done about this. And I think there is a vast area of American public opinion that has to be uh, presented with the facts. This is a very good presentation. I don't know if the uh, organizers of the conference have the wherewithal uh, to duplicate this uh, video. I don't know with the technology available, it shouldn't be a big deal. But if this can be duplicated, um, copies of it made, and uh, given just at uh, the expense of what it takes, I mean, it's not going to be that, I think, expensive to obtain something like this. Uh, and if we can take it back to wherever we come from, there are public libraries, uh, you have your congressman's office, you have... Uh, some of you go to school and you have universities available to you. Uh, there are many ways that this can be presented to church groups, even to synagogues. You can go with this to some synagogues. Because one, I, one, of, the, one of the issues that is a, uh, a central issue in Jewish congregations is fear. <coughs> they are afraid of... Um, of the other. Uh, they don't trust anyone, they, much less Palestinians or Muslims or whatever. So what if a person comes to them and says, what's all of this fear about? You know, look at, look at what's happening and let's try to sort this thing out. If they accept that, well, they, you know, that's a first step at least at one level. A lot of things have to be done. I can't be here, you know, trying to outline the many things that have to be done. But one of the things that has to be done is to try to have contact with especially some of these, uh, some of these I know, some of the individuals that you were listening to, I've spoken to, and um, we've had somewhat of a discussion uh, about the Palestinian issue. But it's different when you speak to one individual than to speak to a congregation of individuals. So if this type of thing can be presented to um, the general Jewish public and say, okay, what is the fear all about? I mean, you fear the other because there has been a historical breach of trust between you and the other. Okay, let's, you know, let's deal with this. Let's see how far we can go in uh, putting our hand on the sore issue or the sore points between us and you. And, you know, try to explain this to us. Uh, my experience is, and I, it may be uh, uh, an incomplete experience, but my experience is out of maybe uh, ten attempts, eight of them are going to fail. Okay, when you begin your effort, just put that in your mind, or let's make the math easier. Four out of five attempts are going to fail. Put that in your mind and don't let the failure get to you, to you. Because we're, after all, human beings. And sometimes a person begins to count, well, I tried this, this, this five times, and four of them are a failure, and I'm just giving up on this. No, you, you can't work like that. If, if, you know, Rachel Corey, what you just heard her say, I mean, this is just uh, uh, a clear-minded and an unpolluted heart 
as far as, you know, seeing what happens there. And by the way, for those doubting Thomases and those, you know, reluctant and passive and indifferent and neutral individuals that you'll encounter here and there, you know, one of the statements that was made was that you really can't understand what is happening there unless you go there. And uh, we are not the majority of us, I think. We are not as uh, poverty stricken as to be unable to go there. So you may want to suggest for the people who have their emotions with the Palestinian issue, but their bodies and their physical energies outside of the Palestinian issue, you might want, want to tell them, okay, just give your emotions um, the benefit of the doubt and go and see what's happening there, like one of the speakers said on, uh, in this presentation, for one week. Just go to Gaza or the West Bank for one week and see for yourselves, for in the case of one person, see for yourself what is happening there. That's the biggest lesson. None of, none of this will penetrate the indifference and the, uh, the non-involvement of people. Uh, nothing is going to match just being there and seeing things with your own eyes. And if you're scared, and some of us are scared, I know. If you're scared to go there, to Gaza or the West Bank, go to Lebanon and get a sense of the real world. And that's one area, as I said, there's no uh, considerable Islamic contribution to this presentation. But if there were, definitely there would have been uh, some um, uh, comments about the Islamic resistance in Lebanon and about Hezbollah and the way they are treating this whole issue. I think it's about time that uh, the Muslims catch up with the, um, with the momentum of the Islamic resistance and the Islamic um, military answer to the Zionist occupation of Palestine. And it seems like this is the only thing that is going to uh, bring us any results. And you, I think, know firsthand that because the Islamic State in Iran is the only uh, state in the world that is serious about the Palestinian uh, issue, uh, that is why it is in the position that is, it is in nowadays. It only takes one thing, one thing out of all of the policies of the Islamic State to uh, normalize its relations with uh, the type of powers right now that are taking issue with it. And that one issue is the one that you were just looking at. Step back from that and you will see people want prosperity and they want all of this other stuff. That's the only thing it takes. And uh, you have the choice. Either you are true to your convictions, which you've been seeing in live uh, presentation, or uh, you want to have the benefits of uh, both worlds, so to speak. You want to be um, uh, theoretical Muslims, but you resist being the, the necessary uh, revolt that comes from that theory uh, to practice it indeed. Um, we all have, and I'm going to end with this note, I took a little more than my time. Um, I'm going to end with this note. We, we have Yawm al-Quds, the International Day of al-Quds, during the last Friday in the month of Ramadan. This year, the month of Ramadan, this coming year, the month of Ramadan is going to almost coincide with the full month of August. I haven't looked at the calendar yet, but it, probably the last Friday in the week of August, it makes it a little easier for you to imagine this on your uh, calendar. 
that Friday is designated as the day of Al-Quds. Um, it would be very appropriate here to, even though we still have maybe eight months or so to arrive to that day, but this needs preparation, and uh, you might want to think about coordinating, some of you come from different states, from different regions of the country, about coordinating a, um, a, uh, a protest movement uh, that will be much more significant, significant than the previous ones in the cities that they are held in. Uh, you know, there's different cities in the country, and uh, there could be more involvement. You can go to others who are not Muslims. Uh, and there are free souls and uh, non-polluted minds out there that want justice as much as you and I want justice. And I think there has to be an outreach to these types of groups. Uh, maybe something can be, you can begin something here. There, there should have been maybe one table there uh, outside that is designated for Yawm Al-Quds and for those individuals who can set aside just a few hours a month. It's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. Just a few hours a, a month to try to get other justice-centered people involved in expressing their opposition to U.S. policy the way it's strangled by the Israeli Zionist nation state. Free it from that strangulation and have it see the light of day and become uh, a nation that doesn't support occupation, an occupation that kills. Uh, thank you for your patience with, with me this uh, evening.